Um, obviously, uh, Coach Matt Milton is the quarterbacks and be backs coach at Harding University, uh, the defending national two uh, national champion, the defending division two national champions. Geez. Um, so it's a pleasure to have them start off. And uh, Coach is going to talk about offense efficiency and field position. Uh, coach, the floor is yours. Hey, guys. Can everybody hear me? All right. I should be good. Can you hear me, Coach? Yes, I can hear you. Good to go, Coach. All right. All right. Uh, first of all, thanks, guys, for uh, for having me on. Uh, when I was reached out uh, about talking, uh, Coach Purvis, we, we talked about several things. But really, how I want to start, I know there's going to be a whole lot of X's and O's that are going to be talked about during during this day. But my biggest deal is – is really where we're at, how we consider offensive efficiency and why field position is so important to us uh, because uh, it goes hand in hand. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about a lot of that, that different stuff. Um, but here's probably one of my coolest charts. This has been a study over six years of FCS and FBS of what we actually consider odds of scoring. So when you look at the actual – football field you can see it um, as you're backed up inside your 10 you have a one in 30 chance to score a touchdown if you're between your 10 and 20 you're one in 15 and then 20 to 30 one in eight and you can see how it goes once you cross midfield and all those things so you know when you're calling a football game um, it's 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 massively important to understand a you're trying to score but also trying to prolong or keep a drive going where you can punt down the opposing offense when they come out inside backed up territory because the odds of them scoring um, are extremely down. You know, to give you a little bit of background, this is my first year since uh, 2003 to not call plays. Uh, I was a college coach for 14 years, and I was a head high school coach for several, which is how I know a lot of these guys on here – and then it really just been back in the last year. So when we look at these things, that's what all that, that means. Um, these are our drives uh, for Harding uh, this past season, which they're skewed. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, we had a lot of success. Um, so if you take that same template of actual what is expected and what we did, uh, you can see how high we are in the actual scoring percentage. So, for instance, zero to 10 yards backed up, you're really only supposed to have a one in 30 chance to score. We had 15 drives. We scored eight touchdowns on 15 drives, which is unheard of. So 53% of the time we scored. You're not supposed to do that. You can see the next one, 10 to 20, one out of 15 is expected. We scored 10 out of 13 times. <clears throat> and then the minus 20 to minus 30, uh, I suppose score one out of eight times. We were 28 out of 39 drives. And you can see how all that goes down. So so I do know our numbers are pretty skewed because we had a lot of success. So we've probably scored a good bit. Well, we actually scored a good bit more than the than the normal average team. Um, so our percentages are are much are much higher. Now this, I don't really want to name a name, but this is an average five and six team in the Great American Conference offensive football team with a six and five record. This shows you the difference in how these numbers work. They're backed up zero to 10 yards. Expected scoring percentage supposed to be one out of 30. They were actually one out of 10. So their efficiency was if you broke that out, they would score three out of 30 times. And then you can see how the numbers have changed drastically on that, but it's 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 still a pretty good offensive uh, scoring football team because you can see in every category what's expected and what is the actual. They were ahead in all those, which kind of explains being six and five and where you're at um, and those things in scoring. Here's kind of how we measure um, an efficiency scale for us. And I'm sure a lot of you guys do the same thing. Uh, but obviously, first down, and it should be in most offenses, but in ours, first down is everything. Um, so we try to win on first down, period, in discussion, because we know 
that we want to get four plus yards on first down. And basically that gives us second down to cut the difference in half. So if, if on first down we got four yards, that's a win. That means we have six remaining yards, but we essentially have two extra downs. Now, now us, uh, we're a huge fourth down team. Fourth down's another down to us for the most part. So for a lot of you guys might not be that way, but if you're super efficient on first down, um, you get four plus yards, then you're ahead of the efficiency scale to be able to split the difference on what is left. So obviously you can adjust the criteria, uh, criteria as you seem necessary, however you want to do that. But these are how we break it down. So for instance, on first down, we get four plus yards. Second down, we want to get at least half the distance of what's left. Third down, obviously want to pick up the first down. Um, and then fourth down is just another uh, type um, down for us. This is probably a really cool stat. This is our actual Harding scoring efficiency. And what I'm getting at is of why first downs are so important in a series is the way we broke it down or what we actually had this year. And I, and I understand we, we had success doing it. But if we got four yards, four plus yards on the first play of every series, we scored touchdowns 79% of the time, which goes all the way back again to why first down is such a big deal in a, in a play calling spectrum. It doesn't really matter if you're split back veer, if you're eye veer, if you're flex bone, if you're spread, whatever it is, first down tells us everything. If we got one first down in a series – so not only did we get four plus yards, but if we got the first down, the first first down in the series, we scored TDs 76.7% of the time. Now here's what stopped those. We had, we had seven fumbles and two penalties on what I would consider scoring drives or opportunities to score. So if you really look at that from this perspective, if you got one first down in the series and we played clean – which means no fumbles, no 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 penalties. We scored TDs 83.3% of the time, which is kind of cool when you look at it. So, so you can look and say we scored on 70% of our total drives and TDs, which is 63%. We had 139 total drives in 15 games. I know that's a lot, but again, it goes back to this, winning on first down, your first down call, it's got to be a phenomenal play call in whatever offense you're running. And our offense, I bet if you took our 15 games, I bet 13 of those games we started every single game or a play with zone dive because we didn't necessarily know what front we would get. We knew we could double an interior guy and get yardage. Um, that was a big deal for us. So, so, again, that being such a high percentage efficiency play for us is why – we went first down a lot. Now, if you guys broke us down, you'd say, well, I know what they're running. And you and you probably would. But that's why it was such a big deal for us to be able to do that. This is my next um, opinion. You know, we talk about running the football, being flex bone and all these things. Uh, it's kind of comical. 15 games this year, we threw the ball 58 times, um, which is kind of a wow, wow factor, you know. Um but we still hold true to this. Um, if you – to become more efficient, I don't care if you throw 58 times the year, which is four times a game, you throw it 10 or 15, um, you have to maintain a passing completion percentage of at least 50, 65% or greater um, because when you are running option-oriented football – your throws are big plays or explosive plays, which is a fake crack seam up the up the middle of the field. So those are really huge because we're not dinking, dinking. We're taking shots off a of play action, which is why you've really got to maintain that. And the next thing is develop a run game that picks up the necessary yardage on critical downs. What are you good at? What is your team good at? 
And I think so many times, and I'll talk about this later in the presentation, it's as, as a coach, and I did this for years, um, I like this call, um, but my quarterback might like something else. And, and again, you've got to develop a run game in the mindset that he's good at reading things and what he does well and make sure that you're you're putting your offense in a position to be successful. Um you know, it's one of these things, again, you can adjust this to however you feel necessary that you're that you're trying to what you're trying to accomplish. Some of you guys might say 70 percent completion percentage or 75, depending on what's involved. Ours were so many down the field chunk throws that they weren't always a high percentage completion play, which is why we did that. But I think it it changes your perspective on the content you have within your playbook. Um, and the amount of calls that you carry from game to game and really the strengths and weaknesses of your personnel. And again, I put this at the bottom of it, especially at the quarterback position. We all know we have guys, whether we're heavy run or not, that have to throw the football adequately to be successful. But there are certain things they throw well and certain things they don't. It's our job really as an offensive staff to make sure we're putting those guys in a situation to have these two main factors to be, to be more efficient. Here's kind of another cool track. And again, you know, I know we're, we're, we're heavy run teams who we're talking to on here, but I still think this really correlates and it's of the 2022 FBS teams, only 19 starting quarterbacks, and I just put, I know there's more than 120 that actually competed. Of 120 teams, completed the ball at a rate of 65% or more. Now, I know that spread, that's RPO, There's there wasn't one of us type system in this. I mean, you could throw somewhat of Navy and Army in that, in that picture, but that's only 16% of all FBS quarterbacks. So of those 19 quarterbacks – their team averaged 10 and three overall record with a win percentage set 769, which is pretty high. So to further what I'm saying, the top five scoring offenses in the country, four of them had quarterbacks who completed the ball above 65%. I do believe there's direct correlation between completion percentage and the success of production on offense, no matter what offense you run, because we know it's happened to us. I played at West Monroe high school growing up. Uh, in Louisiana, for you guys are on here, was a, a dominant dynasty for years. They're, they're not anymore. Um, but the, the, the reality was, if we were ahead of the sticks or on the scoreboard, the uh, chances of us winning were, were great. If we were behind, because we didn't throw the ball a lick, if we were behind, the chances of us coming back were, were slim and none. And that's why I believe no matter how many times you throw it, your completion percentage has got to be in that percentage for you to be able to throw the football when you need to, to get when the safeties are running alleys to take pitch, to hit them over the top. Then obviously when it comes to run game, um, I, I've always believed you don't have to run the football all the time to have success, but I got news for you. I don't, I don't care if it's NFL um, FBS national championship, division two, high school, whatever the teams that run the football and run it well, win championships. So I believe you got to be able to run the football and, and run it well, no matter what system you're running. So the important thing I think really here is to measure your play calls in small attainable goals, such as of how efficient we are by down and distance, which goes back to first down. We want to get four plus yards. What's my best option call and you sit there and go well coach you just said we do zone dive the majority of the time we do because we don't necessarily know what front we're going to get early and what we really don't want to do is put a quarterback in a bind to, to, to read triple or mid triple or read where crazy things can happen with a with a bad pitch or a misread and then we're behind the sticks because we know how difficult that can be um this is what i believe five steps to becoming more efficient Determine your strengths of your quarterback. And you're sitting there going, well, what does that mean? That doesn't mean throwing the football necessarily. That means what does he read well? What does he do well? 
perfect example. Uh, several years before I got here, they made a, a deep run in the playoffs. They had a guy that really, really, really struggled with reading triple. Um, but but he was a mid triple guy, midline guy that did well. So they limited how many play calls they had from true triple. So what is he good at? And then as an offense, really determine what you're best at. You know, what, what, and we all know this. I mean, I was a high school coach. From year to year, you're changing based off your personnel a lot of times. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily change your skill, but one year you might have a quarterback that's much better than the next one at doing certain things. So determine what you're best at. And then also condense your game plan. I'll admit it. Um, you know, I was a spread guy. Uh, for a ton of years, I had Bukuza calls. And then what you realize is when you get in the game, you don't call much. And then um, 2015 and 16, I went to the flex bone, had more success as a high school coach doing that than I had done anything else. When And, and basically, it's the same as we do at Harding. It was the Harding system. It was we called what we call the big five plays, and we had like two wrinkles. We set, ran seven plays in a play action. And we were really good at it. So if you look at what we do now, we're, we're the D2 national champions and we run less than 10 plays. Sounds crazy, but that's the truth. So condense your game plan and find out what you're good at. And here's the next deal. Script between series. Like the way we call plays is every one of us has our eyes on something. So for instance, in a game, as we're calling plays, we're finding out, okay, what was the defense in before that? So, so a perfect example would be, and in in, in when we call plays, my job as a quarterback, V-back coach is I'm watching interior backers, and I'm tracking, are they following the V-back? What are they doing? And then our, our receiver coach is watching the corners, and then our slot coach is watching the safeties because are they reading the safeties or are they not? And then um, – our play caller tries to get the, the up front or our O-line calls the up front. And then our, our coordinator tries to get a feel on the back end. How do we do that? We talk about everything between series. Now I know it's hard at high school because you're, you might be coaching both ways. How, how, do, how do you do this? It's have answers that you think you're going to see possibly the next series. And we all know us that run the option. I uh, call it the flavor of the week. You never know what you're really going to get, but you got to do a really good job between series of trying to find those things out and then create a halftime checklist. What were we good at? What did we do? What did we do? Well, what were we bad at? Okay. That's out. Um, what adjustments have they made to us and what adjust adjustments do we need to make? But halftime is huge as a coaching staff to talk about these things. Then determining the strengths of your quarterback. We talked about this earlier. Um, evaluate him. What what does he feel the most comfortable with? And how do we determine his best skill sets within the offense that we're running? Whether it's, I know Coach Purvis and them run split back fear. We're flex bone. I know we got some gun wing people. I know we got a lot of that. Okay, what do you do within that? And then by knowing what he's good at or strengths at, then that helps identify the calls that I should – or we should make that complement his strengths. Just like I talked about earlier, simply put, don't call things he isn't good at. Then determine as a team what you're best at. We talked about that earlier, Earlier, whether win or lose. First things I said I or we look at after a game is completion percentage turnover, turnovers and our efficiency breakdown. Because we're going to run the football and we're going to run it well. But how were we in those efficiency goals of being able to do that? And then the difference in us, a lot of times winning big or not, is did we complete those big bomb throws down the field, which were play action shots, for that percentage? I don't care about how many yards we throw throw for. I really don't even care about how many rushing touchdowns we had. I just want to know if we put our quarterback, and more specifically our offense, in position for success. Because is he reading well? You know, or, or are they starting a three? Then they move to a two-eye. Then they move to a shade. Are we reading well? Who's walked up on the line of scrimmage? Who's he pitching off of? What did he do well? And then I want to know what calls we made during the course of the game that were consistent with what we prepared for. And then did we play into the strengths of our personnel? And then the third one we just talked about was condense your game plan. Less is more. I believe it. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's in simplicity of what we do. Uh, be good at what you do. If you're a jack of all trades, you're masters of none. I went through that a lot of times in years of me 
thinking I had the answers. Uh, but the reality is if you're really good at the few things you do, then you're going to be pretty special. And, and again, I'm continually amazed at how few plays we actually run. You know, with a game week, I'm, you know, we constantly evaluate the comfort our, our kids feel with what looks we feel like we were going to get. Any adjustments we made to existing plays or wrinkles. At Harding, we're huge on tags. We run our base stuff, but then we tag like blocking schemes on the perimeter. That's a difference for us. What do we do? If we didn't execute those at a high level, chunk them, scrap them. Focus instead on what generates high efficiency within your offense. And this is really talking to myself for years of what, what we've done is you can't be prideful with what you want to run as a coach. It's, <clears throat> it's always about the players on the field and whether or not they can perform their responsibility. How do they do that? It's being simple. The KISS method, keep it simple, stupid. I know that sounds crazy, but <clears throat> especially coaching high school as many years as I did, you don't have all these long meeting times and all this. You've got to you got to be able to coach on the fly and have all these availabilities to get that stuff done and for them to understand what you're doing. And then number four, script between plays. That's how you keep up with what you're calling. You, know, you might have somebody scripting what you did, and then here's the formations I want to look at, not necessarily plays. Uh, again. We draft sometimes four or five play script while you're on the field. Well, you sit there and say, well, how do you do that? The defense doesn't give you that. Well, it's more formations than anything. And the biggest thing is keep your emotions in check. Make sure you're hitting the best calls from your game plan per series. You all know it's play callers. It gets hard. And you're like, man, I, I wish I would have called that play. Man, I meant to call that play. This is how you keep up with that. Also gives your quarterback a chance to be in rhythm throughout the game and then gives you the opportunity to communicate to the offense before they take the field. And then what calls to expect. And then create the halftime checklist is really, this will give you a better uh, picture of what you accomplished in the first half. And then what adjustments we need to make, what calls we did make, and what we still have on the shelf and what we hadn't done. What's effective and ineffective. One of the things we track in, is how many first downs in a quarter. This helps us identify run-pass ratio if we're calling a game that is helping us maintain efficiency on a first down. This impacts our effectiveness on all other downs. And then the goal, um, and this is really it before we get to questions, but the biggest deal is the goal for every program is to continue to close the gap by taking another step towards becoming the best you possibly can be. And this is what I told the offensive unit in our, in our first meeting before the season, going from good to great in any level of football. I don't care if it's major college football, small college, high school, small high school, junior high. Going from good to great in any level of football is as small of a gap as there is. But it is often the most challenging to overcome. The difference to me is not reinventing yourself. It's really becoming better and more efficient at what you already do. So a perfect example, a year ago, we didn't get the playoffs. We're nine and two. They'd made a playoff run the year before, got to the quarters. They won a lot of, a lot of games here. What puts us over the top? What made us win the national championship this year? Obviously, a lot of luck comes along with that. We won two one-point games and the playoffs. I get it but we condensed a whole lot of what we did and we threw a whole bunch of stuff out. It's kind of comical. If you go back and you watch what we did when I told you we did less than 10 things and we were just really, really good at. It. So, you know, that's kind of the, the fast forward of trying to get this in in 25 minutes of telling you guys, I think efficiency is huge. I think that's how you judge how your offense is preparing and what you do and your success and if there's one thing that you take from any of this is first down is the down that matters, that gives you a chance to be successful. And then getting a first down in the first series sets you up uh, to be able to drive down the field and score, whether it's kick a field goal or not. And if you don't score, be able to sustain drives to put you in a situation where you can punt the football and back the opposing offense up when they come out backed up inside their 20 because you saw the stats and numbers of the expectation of what it is for them to score. So field position is massive in being successful 
uh, on offense and really any football team. Any questions? Well, I got a couple here. Um, I'll do the funny one first. Uh, how much did Coach Purvis pay you for you to say nice things about him? That's the first. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. He didn't do anything. He just I'm familiar with that area, so I kind of know. I've known him a long time, does a good job, and I love watching those guys. In, in our area, he'll tell you there's not a lot of people that, that run the option anymore, you know, so you kind of identify who those guys are. Okay, uh, the first, and I'm just looking at our at our stream here, is regarding your 65% completion percentage goal, yep. do you set a target or want a minimum yard per catch average? Yep, yep. So, so here's our deal, and, and I wish we did more. We could, we could throw hitches and slants all day long and, and people give it to us. Um, we're trying to get there. You know, I wish we could. Our completion percentage, I'll be honest with you, is all off of naked boots, off a of rocket toss, or down the field fake cracks on inside beer. So I'll tell you, on average of our long, what we call Wisconsin deep throw, the ball is caught between 26 and 31 yards on average in the air. And that's because the safety's running the alley, receiver goes to crack, he slips. But here's my deal. If you go back out of 58 balls that we threw, we threw almost 15 touchdowns. And we didn't complete. Now, here, here, here's the kicker. We didn't complete 30 balls. And that's wild to say, but that's why it's so efficient to complete those big balls. Yeah. And then the other, and again, coaches that are are jumping in and out, like don't be, don't hesitate to ask questions. But um, how much freedom does the do you, your head coach, and the the offensive staff give your quarterbacks to either audible or flip the plays according to what he's seeing, uh, whether it's run or pass? So pr pretty wild. Um, you know, I grew up. I played for Shouse, West Monroe. We checked everything in the line of scrimmage. We don't let our kids check anything. We do 100% check with me. So you, you say we're no huddle, we're no huddle, but we're still going to snap the ball with three to four seconds left. But the reality is um, we're doing all that for him. Now, we might give him a tag or two, but he's not checking out of the plays. We as coaches from up top are trying to get him the best possible play call or do that. I know that's different in option football but that works best for us because then it allows him to see his read key is, is one is two is three, yeah. you know, his read key is pitch key, whatever else versus, okay, I got to get in this look. I got to do this. Cause a big thing that we get is shifts in movement versus us. So if he gets a first peak, then it's a movement. So we try to take that out of him. So to be honest with you, we're ultra, ultra vanilla with what we allow him to do. Okay. Okay. Perfect, Coach. And I, I think that's it on the questions, which actually leaves us at, like, perfect time. Um, Good. So, coaches, um, don't hesitate to reach out to Coach. Yeah, reach out to me. Yeah. Um, I know I, I I tagged you earlier. Uh, his Twitter is at MattyMid3. Um, yeah. So, you can easily – I mean, if you – and then I know, like, I know very well the Harding staff, if you reach out to any of them, are all absolutely, fan, absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. and that's not just like true to Southern people. I mean, you guys go around the country, talk yep. and help yep. out yep. coaches. Um, so again, we just love to talk ball. So any, yeah. anybody needs any help, give me a call. I'd love to do it. So, well, perfect coach. I appreciate you. Um, and I mean, you can either stay on this call, um, or jump, jump off. It's up to you. Um, okay. and then, oh, wait, wait, uh, nope, nope. That's just a comment saying you did a great job. Okay. So uh, thank you all very much. I appreciate you guys. And if there's anything I can do, great. I, I really am more excited about you guys and doing this because it's going to be a heck of a day talking about ground and pound and getting after it. So appreciate thanks, guys. It. Appreciate it, Coach.